on the ratio oh. that we want. So, and it worked well, yeah, with us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh. So we use we use both um gas pack and gas tank. Yeah. It's not complicated so, to pack. isolate the Campylobacter jejuni. It's not complicated. Um, you mean to isolate Campylobacter? Yes. yes. Um, for us, it's okay. You know, mm -hmm. but but I heard. I mean, because in our department, we also we also I mean designate as a FAO mm -hmm. reference center for foodborne pathogens and antimicrobial resistance, and we have some questions about Campylobacter to when they cannot, you know. They cannot grow it, but for us, our research is it's okay. Yeah. How long for so, growing Campylobacter jejuni? You Take mean a, the whole twenty-four the whole hours overnight? Not, normally, um, first subculture it takes about two days. You know. Oh, two days. Uh, yeah, forty-eight uh, hours. Forty-eight hour, Yeah. Yep, and then we resub culture to get pure isolate. So if you want to do. Everything based on the biochemical test, you know, to confirm it, it may take about five days, six days. Okay, okay it's yeah. good. But if you do some PCR, you know, it's short yeah. time, yeah. 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 <laughs> but, okay, my question. So in Thailand, not this gas pack, but in the tank like that, and then you combine the mean. Can, can you, you, you have, again? you have, uh, but the I mean gas pack like the Japanese or United States make it or you have some specific different oh no I, I mean the... you can use different brands it's okay you know I no, no. I, the <laughs> because... gas pack what we can find in Thailand the cheapest one is from Mitsubishi, Mitsubishi. oh that's Japanese it's, company <laughs> yeah Japanese it's cheaper than those um, Oxoy Oxoy is very expensive you know yeah because oxoy, let's say one box, they have 10 packs. It's maybe around 1400 baht, Thai baht, oh. okay? But for what? Mitsubishi, mm -hmm. for Mitsubishi, about 1000 baht, yeah. So it's cheaper for us and it's work well. <laughs> okay, good. Yeah, but <laughs> in Indonesia, import, importing that specific is not so easy. That's the problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So that I specific, mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah, one, one thing is, you know, you need to, I mean, I, I'm, I'm quite lucky that when I apply for the grant, and oh, okay I see. because you use more money, you know, than you work <laughs> with E. coli or other bacteria. Yeah, yeah. very expensive. That's yeah. <laughs> ah, terrible. <laughs> yeah. I work for... Uh, I forget up uh, anaerobe, mm -hmm. but we works with Japanese, so I can previously mm -hmm. five or ten years before. I see. Plus, uh, plus it even difficile, plus it even difficile. Oh yeah. Yeah, that's. I think Cold, that's right? terrible, yeah. terrible thing. Not yeah. easy. I I think um anaerobe may be more difficult. Because you probably need that um, anaerobe chamber, right? To do everything yeah. in the chamber, which is, <laughs> yeah. is more expensive. For Campylobacter, we, you can still do on the bench, you know? It's okay. Oh, because we need specific, uh, what the, for collecting sample. That's uh, specific. Exactly, yeah. Ah, that's very. <laughs> yeah. That's I say, I mean. okay, if you not support again, I cannot do working. That's finished. Yeah, yeah. That, that's, <laughs> that's, right, that's right. Not easy to get it. Very difficult. <clears throat> Mm -hmm, yeah. Yeah, and I hope it's still open up the field, but it's not easy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, excuse me, Dr. Hadi. Oh, yeah. So please. Okay. Our event is about to begin. Okay. Now is one what a call. <laughs> Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon to all the participants. The Honorable Vice Dean, Faculty of Veterinary Medicine, Universitas Erlangga, Professor mm -hmm. Dr. Helmi Effendi, DVM, The Honorable Orchestra Lecturer, Dr. Taradon, <coughs> DVM, PSD, from Chulalongkorn, University, University Thailand, and the Honorable Orchestra Lecturer and all the participants. 
First of all, let us pray and pray to Allah. Because of His bless and mercy, we can come together without any obstacle with healthy condition in this event. I'm very pleased to see you here, and it is our pleasure to welcome you to our guest lecture. My name is Prima Ayu Bibawati, the Master of Ceremony of today's event. Ladies and gentlemen, before we start the event, let me share the agenda of this event. The first agenda is opening. The second is uh, singing Indonesia Raya and hymn Erlangga. The third agenda is opening remark. The fourth is position. The fifth agenda is presentation from the speaker. And the sixth agenda are discussion, resume, and certificate awarding. And the last is closing. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, the first agenda is opening. Let's start this agenda by praying according to the respective religion and belief. Let's pray together. Pray begin. Pray finish. Thank you. And the next agenda is singing Indonesia Raya and hymn Erlangga.
Okay. Now we come to the third agenda, which is opening remark from Vice Dean of Faculty Veterinary Medicine Universitas Erlangga, Professor Dr. Mustafa Helmi Effendi. To Professor Helmi, the time is yours. Professor Helmi. Okay, just a minute, just a minute. Okay. Okay. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Alhamdulillahirrabbilanamin. First of all, let us give thanks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has given various pleasure on all of us. One of the favor now we feel it is a blessing of health so we can hold this guest lecture. Furthermore, let me express my appreciation and gratitude and thanks to Adiana Mutamsari with Tanning Room DVM who is ambassador, faculty ambassador. And also thanks to Dr. Dadi Raharjo as the head of Veterinary Public Health Division. And also thanks to Dr. Sule Estu Pangesti as moderator in this guest lecture. And also the entire guest lecture committee who have prepared this much awaited event. This is very important for me to convey, considering that the Faculty of Veterinary Medicine now is working hard to achieve public recognition as a quality faculty in Erlanga University in implementing a quality management system toward the world-class university, WCU. The quality above are qualities that are balanced throughout in Bahasa Indonesia we call Tridharma Perguruan Tinggi that consists of three pillars, education, research, and community services, while maintaining the noble character within carry it out. The, the guest lecture theme Campylobacter and its relation to poultry production. Of course, it will be useful for the development quality of my student in veterinary science in the future. Finally, I would like to thank you to Dr. Taradon Luang Tongkum for giving in the guest lecture held by the faculty ambassador with the hope that it will give enlightenment for us, especially those who are always involved in research, learning, and the application of the veterinary field in our respective lives. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Professor Helmi, for the opening remark. And then the next agenda is photo session. We will take a picture, all of you, the participants. So please turn on all your camera. The operator will screenshot from first slide until the last one. Please, the operator, take a picture. Okay. <laughs> okay, please turn on your camera and I will uh, take a picture. One, two, three. Okay, and the second slide. One, two, three. Okay, thank you. Okay. You're welcome. <laughs> thank you and thank you so much for your cooperation.
So for the next agenda is the main agenda, which we are waiting for. Presentation for the speaker, Dr. Terada. Yeah. For the presentation session will be guided by a moderator. I would like to read the curriculum vitae of our moderator today. Okay, this is the curriculum vitae. Our moderator today name is Dr. Agne, Dr. Agnes Teresia Sule Estupangesti, DVM. She was born in Surabaya, Indonesia, September 15, 1956. She is a lecturer in Division of Veterinary Public Health, Faculty of Veterinary Medicine, University of Erlangga. Her academic qualification in 1983, she has received her Doctor of Veterinary Medicine in Faculty of Veterinary Medicine, University of Erlangga. In 1994, she has got her doctorate in veterinary medicine, faculty of Justus Liebig University, Giessen, Germany. Uh, and her research area about veterinary public health. Okay, that uh, curriculum faculty about our moderator today. Now, please welcome Dr. Sule. Okay, thank you, Dr. Prima. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Our distinguished Professor Henry, the Vice Dean of our faculty. Okay, thank you. Our guest lecturer, Dr. Taradon Luang Chong Fung. Our Chief Division of Veterinary Public Health. All the distinguished colleagues, lecturers, and uh, guests, and also uh, all the students of our faculty. <clears throat> First of all, I want to say good morning. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. And uh, I would like uh, to welcome you all to this prestigious meeting, lecture about Campylobacter and its relation to poultry production, which is held by the Jakarta program of Erlangga University. And <clears throat> I will then uh, introduce you about the, our guest lecture, Dr. Taradon. Dr. Taradon uh, held his PhD in the Ohio State University Columbus in uh, 2005. And uh, Dr. Taradon is also a doctor of veterinary medicine in Chulalongkorn University, Bangkok, Thailand. His research area is a pre and post harvest food safety focusing on ecology and epidemiology of foodborne pathogens, which is particularly Campylobacter species in food animal population, and also emergence, transmission, and persistence of antibiotic resistant Campylobacter, as well as other foodborne pathogens in animal reservoirs. And also strategies to control Campylobacter and other foodborne pathogens at the farm and processing levels. Dr. Taradon, I think all of the audience uh, want to know all about uh, interesting topic that you will help, that you will give to us today and now I give uh, time for you. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, you can have uh, your time about 50 minutes to one hour. Okay, so, okay, thank you very much, um, Dr. Solin. So I think um, my, my presentation may take longer than 50 minutes, it's okay, right? It's okay. No problem, no problem. Okay. I give you special permission. 
Okay, okay. thank you. <laughs> yeah. So, yep. Yeah. So, so, uh, so that in that case, I don't have you know to speed up very much. Okay, and then we can just um, go to every topics that I prepare. Okay. Okay. Good. Okay. So, this is the outline of my presentation today. So first, you know, I will talk about um, an overview and importance of Campylobacter first, and then it will be the main discussion for today. It's going to be about epidemiology and strategies for control and prevention of Campylobacter in poultry production. And finally, I will touch a little bit in the last, last part on the antimicrobial resistance of Campylobacter, okay? So for the first one, you know, I think um, everyone may already be familiar with Campylobacter, so Campylobacter is the gram-negative um, non-spore-forming curved rut chef bacteria. The unique things about this um, organism when compared to other foodborne pathogen is uh, Campylobacter is microallophilic, okay? Oh, okay? Which means that they require like a low level of oxygen for growth. Normally Campylobacter grow well in the environment containing oxygen about 5% and then 10% carbon dioxide. And in terms of the temperature, um, today, you know, we're going to talk about Campylobacter that are the important cause of foodborne disease, which we call thermophilic Campylobacter. The reason that we call it thermophilic Campylobacter is because they can grow well at the temperature between 37 to 42 degrees Celsius. Especially if you still remember, this one, you know, is the temperature for poultry, right? For chicken, body temperature of the chicken. So that's why uh, chicken is the main reservoir of this um, pathogen, okay? Another thing is that uh, Campylobacter, they do not multiply in food, which is different from Salmonella or E. coli, that when they contaminate um, food, they can still multiply, but Campylobacter is not multiplied in food, okay? And another inter interesting feature of Campylobacter is that Campylobacter is viable but non culturable or we call it VBNC. This one, we found it when Campylobacter exposed to those um, outside environment. They will change from this um, spirot bacilli to the coccoid form. And then once they change to coccoid form, they can still, they still survive, but they're not going to show, you know, if you try to culture it, you cannot grow Campylobacter in the VBNC conditions, okay? And this is how Campylobacter look like on the specific media. This one we call MCCDA, which is selective media that we normally use to grow Campylobacter. And you will see that Campylobacter show that um, the gray itch, you know, and glistening colony. And this is how Campylobacter look like on blood agar. You know, if you're interested in terms of isolation, we can discuss later after the presentation, okay? So, in terms of animal reservoirs, Campylobacter can be found in the intestinal tract of varieties of animals. It can found in uh, domestic or wild animals, you know, and especially those um, chickens, okay? And this one, normally Campylobacter, they don't cause any disease in the animal host, except for certain strain, like a Campylobacter jejuni. Certain strain of Campylobacter jejuni can cause abortion in sheep, okay? But normally, Campylobacter thermophilic, Campylobacter like the one, Campylobacter jejuni or Campylobacter coli, this organism, they don't cause any disease in the host, okay? And please don't be confused with those Campylobacter fetus. If you remember, Campylobacter fetus can also cause abortion in cattle, but for Campylobacter fetus, we don't consider them as a thermophilic Campylobacter because Campylobacter fetus cannot grow at the 37, you know, or 42 degrees Celsius, okay? As you see in this picture, uh, Campylobacter, the main one that causes a foodborne disease in human, there are two species. The first one is Campylobacter jejuni, which commonly found in those um, chickens, you know, like a broiler chickens. And in addition to broiler chicken, they're also found in sheep or cattle, dairy cattle. But Another Campylobacter species we call Campylobacter coli. This one, they commonly found in pigs and in turkey, okay? But anyway, this, you can see that Campylobacter, you know, can found in many 
different types of animals. And the importance of this organism is that Campylobacter is the leading cause of foodborne disease in many countries worldwide, especially in the developed countries, like in the U US or in the UK. Right now, Campylobacter seems to be the number one foodborne pathogen. And among Campylobacter species that cause foodborne disease, Campylobacter jejuni is the most prevalent one. About 85% of the case came from Campylobacter jejuni. And the rest, about 10% came from Campylobacter coli. And the rest came from other Campylobacter species like a Campylobacter absalensis or Campylobacter lalai. This picture shows you, you know, the prevalence of Campylobacter in different countries. Generally, Campylobacter, you know, you found it's about 400 to 500 million cases a year worldwide, okay? And WHO also consider Campylobacter as the most common bacterial cause of human gastroenteritis. And if you look at this one, this is the recent publication, you know, from the um, CDC that report last year. Among the foodborne bacterial pathogen that found in the US, Campylobacter, you know, is the number one. It's chair about 38%, followed by Salmonella, and then uh, she got toxin producing E. coli, like an E. coli 157H7, things like that. And how people get Campylobacter. Normally, you know, you can get Campylobacter from um, consumption of undercooked poultry meat or food that are cross contaminated with um, raw chickens. In addition to those um, chicken, as I just mentioned, that Campylobacter can also be found in milk, in dairy cattle. So if you drink unpasteurized milk or eat, you know, unpasteurized dairy products, in that case, it will be increased your chance to get Campylobacter. And it's quite interesting things too, you know, between these two foods, if you see the big outbreak, the big outbreak usually it came from those drinking unpasteurized milk, but for the eat chicken, raw chicken, normally it comes like a the sporadic case, you know. In terms of the symptoms of Campylobacter, it's quite interesting too, because a Campylobacter in developing countries and developed country, it's quite different. In developing countries, mainly we found Campylobacter in young children, you know, normally around five years old. And then the main symptom is watery diarrhea. But for the, in the developed countries, usually they found Campylobacter, foodborne Campylobacterosis in adult, young adult. And then usually they cause a bloody diarrhea, okay? And normally Campylobacter, Incubation period of Campylobacter, it's about two to five days. And it's self-limiting disease, which means that um, once you get infected, you can get better, you know, in a few days without treatment. You don't need to treat Campylobacter infection. You just, you know, replace the electrolyte or fluid that you lost. But in some case, like in the immunocompromised person, in that case, Campylobacter may cause the severe symptoms. And in that case, that's why you need to treat. And for the treatment, you know, normally macrolides like erythromycin and fulloquinolone, FQ here, stand for fulloquinolones like a ciprofloxacin or norfloxacin. These are the antibiotic of choice for the treatment of woodborne campylobacterosis. And I would like you to remember these two, you know, groups of the antibiotics because we're going to discuss more when we talk about those antibiotic resistance in Campylobacter, okay? The symptom is quite common, mainly, you know, diarrhea. You may have some uh, cramp or nausea a little bit. And another important thing about Campylobacter, besides those, they cause a foodborne diarrhea. The long-term complication, you know, that associated with uh, Campylobacter such as um, glenn barre syndrome, or we call GBS, which is the flaxseed paralysis of the peripheral nervous system, you know. So your arms, your legs, you don't have the muscle tone, things like that. Or reactive arthritis, or irritable bowel syndrome. This one, you know, can be associated with a Campylobacter infection. So now, can you prevent um, foodborne Campylobacterosis? Um, absolutely, I mean, 
this organism die very easily, you know. If you cook food, your food very well, Campylobacter will die and don't cause any disease. Also, so that's why if you avoid consumption of raw undercooked poultry meat, or if you avoid those drinking unpasteurized milk, in that case, you know, you quite safe, you know, from the Campylobacter. And also, another important thing is if you prevent those cross contamination in the kitchen, it will also reduce, you know, the prevalence of foodborne Campylobacterosis, because right now. In many developed countries, they found that um, the main cause of foodborne Campylobacterosis is due to eating food that cross-contaminated with um, Campylobacter. For example, like if you use a knife and kitchen, you cut your chickens, okay, and you don't clean it, it very well. You just rinse those knife and cutting board with water, and then you use the same knife and cutting boards, you know, cut your vegetable, for example, like a salad or uh, fruit, and then you eat those fruit or vegetable, in that case, you know, your food may be cross-contaminated with a Campylobacter and it can cause the disease, okay? So that's why I think it's important to reduce Campylobacter at both, you know, pre- and post-harvest level, okay? So this is, I just want to give you, for the first part, I just want to give you an idea about Campylobacter. So now I think you get some background of this organism, right? So the next part, we're gonna focus more on um, epidemiology and the strategies to control, you know, this foodborne pathogen in poultry production. Okay. So as you know, um, Campylobacter can be found, as I just mentioned, you know, that Campylobacter is commonly found in chickens, especially broiler chickens, and the prevalence of Campylobacter in broiler chickens. It maybe varies between countries, you know, ranging from 0% to 100%. It depends on the biosecurity, how good your biosecurity is, and also how um, the way that you raise your chickens and the flock. But I can say for, for sure that it's impossible to get 0% every time that you grow chickens, you know. Because Campylobacter can be used as a trade barrier, but the reason is they don't using it right now is because, especially for Thailand, Thailand, you know, we export a lot of chickens to EU countries. And we expect that um, Campylobacter may be used as a trade barrier. But the reason that Campylobacter still until now, you know, even we heard from this new maybe 10 years ago, but Campylobacter still don't use as a trade barrier like a salmonella. Because even in the European country itself, they still cannot control Campylobacter. They can these. They still cannot produce like a zero percent um, Campylobacter-free flocks. You know, like a Salmonella. So that's why. But they try. But they are trying to do it. You know. So that's why we need to prevent those things. Okay. So normally Campylobacter will have a high prevalence in boiled chicken, especially the one if you grow your chicken outside like a free range system or organic chickens, that, that your chicken has a chance to run around, you know, on the pasture. In that case, you have more chance to get Campylobacter. In um, countries in the temperate zone, like in the European countries or in the US, they found that Campylobacter is a seasonal variation, which um, is going to have high prevalence during the summer month, like a June, July, August. But do we gonna see the same thing in our countries, like in tropical countries, like in Thailand or in Indonesia here? I'm gonna show you later, okay? And this is the studies that I did when I when I did my PhD in the US. At the time, we compared the prevalence of Campylobacter in conventional and organic farms. You know, for conventional farm here, I mean, they use they rest in the closed system. They use evaporation systems, okay? So birds just rest, are rest in the house all the time throughout their life. But for organic chickens, you know, they can run around in the grass, you know, exposed to sunlight, things like that. Okay, and you can see that in the same conventional broiler and organic broiler, you can see conventional broiler have about 65% of Campylobacter prevalence. But for organic one, they have quite high, almost 90%, okay? And in terms of the ratio, of Campylobacter jejuni and Campylobacter coli, 
we found that if you grow Campylobacter in the closed system, you will see mainly it's Campylobacter jejuni. But once you allow Campylobacter to run allow, you know, outside environment, you see higher proportion of Campylobacter coli. Okay. And normally Campylobacter, you know, you can where you can isolate Campylobacter. Campylobacter is more common in seagum, colon, and cloiga. Chickens can shed Campylobacter in the feces as high as 10 to the 10th CFU per gram feces, okay? If you look at the intestinal tract of the chickens, seagum here, colon, and cloiga, these are the sites that you have high number of Campylobacter. So that's why if we're gonna do some surveillance for Campylobacter, we normally collect from seagum here. This is the main part, okay? But in addition to this area, Campylobacter can also be found in like a jejunum, ileum, ileum jejunum, and duodenum, as well as the gizzard, but it's going to be in the lower prevalence. And also, sometimes you can detect those Campylobacter in liver, spleen, and gallbladder as well. The Another thing I would like you to know is, when Campylobacter you found in the intestinal tract, but Campylobacter they don't adhere directly to epithelial cells, okay? They just stay in the mucus layer in the, of the intestinal tract. So that's why normally Campylobacter, they don't cause any disease in those um, chicken uh, animal reservoirs, okay? Like you see in this picture here, Campylobacter mainly stay in the mucus layer when compared to those um, human. In human, Campylobacter can attach to the epithelial cells, and then you know they can go deeper to sub-epithelial cells and cause the symptoms, you know. Now, generally, I mean, everyone knows that it's quite amazing until today, no one can answer why during the first two weeks, you know, two, three weeks, especially in the broiler, uh, conventional broiler production, like when you grow it in those um, closed systems, okay, in the house with EWAP system. In that case, usually you cannot detect Campylobacter during the first two or three weeks. And then somehow once one bird, you know, become positive, almost every bird in the flock will be infected with Campylobacter just only a few days, you know. And by the end of the week, just only a week, they found that the entire flock will be colonized with Campylobacter. And this likely due to the fecal oral root transmission. As you know, that chicken is like to eat that feces, right? And also, once Campylobacter clonize in the intestinal tract of chickens, they can stay until the birds go to the slaughterhouse, which about six weeks, okay? And this one, when the birds go to the slaughterhouse, and if you don't do it very well in the slaughtering process, if you got a leak of the intestinal tract, intestinal contents, in that case, it will lead to the carcass contamination. So, um, as I just mentioned, these are the knowledge that everyone knows about it. But for Campylobacter in Thailand, at that time when we conduct this project, you know, um, about eight, nine years ago, at that time, we don't have much information about Campylobacter in poultry production in Thailand. So that's why I'd be interested to do it here. Yeah. So I'm going to show you the results, you know, quickly. What our research, what we found here, okay? This one, there are com this project composed of two parts. The, part, the first part, we just do surveillance by collect SIGA from those um, slaughterhouse and we isolate for Campylobacter. This one, we collect from 442 broiler flocks, okay, from 68 farms. And what we found here is the prevalence of um, Campylobacter in Thai broiler production is about 57%, which is lower than our collaborator. This one, we also work with um, the UK group, you know, from University of Liverpool. And in the UK, they found that prevalence of Campylobacter in um, broiler flock is about 70%, but in Thailand, it's about 57%. And it's not surprising at all. Because um, in Thailand, you know, chicken production is belong to big company. So they have quite strict biosecurity measures. When compared to um, chicken that rest in the developed countries, like in the UK, they don't have they don't have to do like a shower in or shower out, you know. But for us, 
especially after that event influenza, you know, big poultry company, they're really strict on the biosecurity. But what I would like to point out is even the biosecurity is very strict, you know, you have to travel in and travel out. We can still detect about 57% of the flock positive for Campylobacter, okay? Another thing that I would like to point out here is within flock, flock prevalence here, once you get, because we collect 10 seagram from each flock, and you can see that almost 100%, that's mean almost 10 seagram that we isolate. Once it came from the positive flock, it's almost every seagram has Campylobacter, okay? And also the number, average number of Campylobacter that we can detect in the seagull contents is about 10 to the eighth or eight log CFU per gram feces. And this one we compare between a uh, farm in the central Thailand and northeastern Thailand. And you can see, I mean, in general, it's um, quite, you know, not much different. Now, this slide I would like to show you is, um, as I just mentioned earlier, that in the countries located in the temperate zone, they found that Campylobacter is seasonal. High is in, the high prevalence may be found in those um, summer months, like in June, July, August. But how about in Thailand or in countries, in tropical countries, which I believe, you know, if you do studies in the Indonesia, you probably see the same thing that you don't see any specific patterns, you know, it's not like a seasonal, you know. So when we compare those, um, because as you know, that countries are located in tropical area like in Thailand, Indonesia here, you know, the temperature is quite consistent throughout the year. So when we do some um, calculation, check for the odd ratio, it's not that significant factors, but the one that has uh, some effects, you know, on Campylobacter colonization, instead of temperature, we found that rainfall or humidity, it seems to have a little bit, you know, effects on those Campylobacter flocks in our country. So that's mean during the rainy season, or especially when you know you have um, high humidity or high rainfall, like it right now. I'm not sure that in Indonesia right now raining or not, but in Thailand right now it's rainy season, and even today, you know, still right now it's still raining. Okay, so once it's raining, become raining, you have more chance to get those Campylobacter positive. And then we also check for the risk factors. What is the factors? You know that associated with Campylobacter colonization in Thai poultry fox. What we found is, the main one is, if you found those Campylobacter in previous flock, we do some um, questionnaires, you know, we collect questionnaires and then we match with, um, do some calculation of the odd ratio. And we found that if um, the previous flock is positive for Campylobacter, it will have, high chance that your flock will be positive, you know. It's about 2.5 times to get a chance to get um, Campylobacter in the flock. And also, if the number of Campylobacter, if the number of chicken in the house higher than 10,000 birds per house, in that case, you have more chance to become Campylobacter positive. The higher the number of chickens in the flock, the higher the chance that you have a Campylobacter positive flock. But in the same time, we also saw that we also found that um, if around the boiler house, you know, had the cobblestone around instead of those grass or soil, in that case, it will help protect you know your flock. So this one we found is protective um, factors. Okay, or if the bird bird catching time is less than two hours, in that case, you know, it less chance that your flock will become positive for Campylobacter, okay? And for the part, the other part of the project that we did is, this one, we do some uh, follow from the breeders to hatcheries, to broiler flocks, and then to the slaughterhouse, okay? And we follow the same flock, like the same eggs that came from the same breeder until those eggs go to hatchery, go to uh, broiler farms and go to slaughterhouse, okay? These are the samples that we collect. And then we do some molecular studies, you know. And these are the sampling scheme that we do, okay? So these are the number of um, 
total samples that we collect. So this, this one is we collect from the farms here and so the house. And this one is the step in the slaughterhouse that we collect samples, okay? So what we found is quite interesting. I would like you to focus here the first part. You can see that in the breeder flocks here, you know, from the five production chains that we follow, except the first one, you know, the rest, Campylobacter prevalence in breeder flock is quite high. It's about 70%, okay? Except the first production chain that we have, less than 40%. And if you look at the ratio between Campylobacter jejuni and Campylobacter coli, what I would like to point out here, you can see that in the breeder flocks here, you can see more of Campylobacter coli. If you still remember in my previous slide, you know, my earlier slides that I showed you, for the broilers, generally we found Campylobacter jejuni, right? But for the breeder flocks here, you can see high number of Campylobacter coli. And then at the hatchery, we cannot isolate, isolate any Campylobacter okay, from the hatcheries. But what we do is for the broiler flocks here, hatchery, we, can try, we try to isolate from the egg shells or from the egg itself, but it's not successful. We cannot isolate any Campylobacter. But for the broiler flocks here, you can see that. What I would like to point out here is 100%. Is Campylobacter jejuni. Okay. We don't, we cannot, we couldn't detect any Campylobacter coli from those. When I say chicken red samples here, I mean like a fecal samples, clinical swap samples. But for environmental sample, it's sample from feed, you know, from water, from litter sample, things like that. Okay. And then at the slaughterhouse, again, for the house, you, we can also find that the majority, 100%. Uh, Campylobacter jejuni. We cannot detect any Campylobacter coli in the samples from the slaughterhouse. Okay, so based on the information I just showed you, you can say that um, the high prevalence of Campylobacter can be found in those breeder flocks. And as I just mentioned, we don't see any Campylobacter positive samples in the hatcheries. Okay, and then if you look at the proportion between Campylobacter jejuni and Campylobacter coli, you can see that um, in the breeder flocks, you know, you see more coli, but for the broiler farms or for the slaughterhouse, only Campylobacter jejuni can detect, okay? So but, uh, another thing that we do is from this project, after that, we do a genetic characterization of those Campylobacter jejuni and Campylobacter coli strain, okay? And we found that, um, for the Campylobacter that we found in breeders, these are the sequence type that we found. So what I would like to point out here is, you can see that the sequence type that we found in breeder and, and the one that we found in broiler flocks or slaughterhouse is quite different, okay? Except for the certain production chain like this one, except this certain strain, and somehow I think this strain can survive very well since, you know, start from those breeder and then go to broiler flocks and go to slaughterhouse. And it's just only one single strain that we found, okay? But for other farm, we can find, let's say, maybe two or three sequence type, but this one is the predominant sequence type that found in each step, okay? So you can see that mainly, you know, if you look at the sequence type of Campylobacter that found from slaughterhouse, and those far from broiler farm, it's quite related, you know, but it's different from those far in the breeder. So based on this finding, I think we can say that um, breeder should not be, you know, the part or the main source of the Campylobacter infection in the flocks, okay? And this one, we do some um, mapping to see which kernel complex, you know, that we found commonly in uh, Campylobacter in each production chain in Thailand. So based on this one, as I just mentioned, you know, this genetic profile of Campylobacter jejuni that we found in breeders is totally different from those found in broilers and also slaughterhouse. But for the broiler and slaughterhouse samples, in that case, you quite, you know, similar sequence type, you know. So based on this information, I think that um, vertical transmission shouldn't be the big problem and also, um, until now, you know, 
we can still cannot identify what is the actual source of Campylobacter infection in Thai viral flocks. And it's not just our studies, but other studies, you know, they also cannot identify the definite source, you know, because it's very hard to do it. So besides those um, broiler chickens, another thing that we do here, which is ongoing project right now here that we do is um, we collect samples from those blackbone chicken, you know, blackbone chickens is um, kind of special breed that they, I mean, like a bone or meat or skin is black, but the the uh, feather feather may be um, some birds may white, some bird may black, you know, but inside like the bone or meat or skin it's become black, okay. And this one we follow for twenty individual, we follow twenty individual birds from maybe the first two day until they hatch until they send to the market to the slaughterhouse. One thing that I would like to point out is if you remember. I told you earlier that for the commercial or conventional broiler chickens, not only Campylobacter cannot be found during the first two or three weeks, right? But here, you can see that even just only two days, we can detect Campylobacter in this bird, okay? But please keep in mind that this one is um, the rest in the open farms. It's not closed system, okay? It's not evaporative system. Open farm means that, you know, air or other wild birds, other things, you know, they can get through the house, okay? You can get some insects inside the house, things like that, okay? But I would like to point out here, you can detect Campylobacter as early as two days, you know? And in one week, two weeks, you can see. And until the birds were sent to slaughterhouse, and the orange bar here represent Campylobacter that we isolate from the seagum. And the green bar, light green here, is the prevalence of Campylobacter in the meat of those blackbone chickens, you know. And if you look at the proportion of Campylobacter jejuni at Campylobacter coli, what we found is, this one is so interesting that I would like to point out here. During the first two days, the first week, you know, first two weeks, I probably say, 90% is colonized by Campylobacter coli which is quite interesting because normally if you remember in my previous, I mean, slide for the conventional broiler flocks, for the conventional broiler flocks that rest in the closed system, it's mainly Campylobacter jejuni, right? In the broilers, 100%. But in the open system here, you can see at the beginning, you see more proportion of Campylobacter coli. And then once you rest chicken longer, you know, after five weeks, 50 days until almost four months, you see the higher number of Campylobacter jejuni, okay? And then when this one uh, from fecal samples that we do, uh, we collect from those, actually we do cloacal swap, you know, from those 20 birds, okay? And then when you look at the seagum, it's, it's until now we still cannot answer why we found the results like this, because you see here, this one, when the birds ready to send to the slaughterhouse at that time, the majority of Campylobacter is jejuni, okay? But the bird, after the birds, this is the same birds, you know, send 20 birds, the same 20 birds were sent to slaughterhouse. And when we collect the sea gum of those birds, we found that 90% are Campylobacter coli. Only 10% is a Campylobacter jejuni. And then when, we collect Campylobacter that contaminate on the meat of those chickens. It's opposite from the seagum. This time only 100% are Campylobacter jejuni, which is very interesting finding for us. So right now uh, we're working on those um, molecular type thing, you know, to see um, what sequence type that we found, you know, and I hope that we maybe we can exp find some explanation of these things, okay? So this is an ongoing project that uh, one of my PhD students working on. And another thing what we do is, beside follow those um, blackbone chicken for the previous one here, this one is came from 20 birds from one farm. This time we also collect, instead of one farm, we collect five farms, okay? And we found that when we do the seagum, 
it shows the similar results, which is cecum from those black bone chicken has more of Campylobacter coli than Campylobacter jejuni. Okay, but for the meat, it's totally opposite, and the same. Every farm shows the same results. When you collect Campylobacter from those chicken meats, you know, from those five farms, the majority are Campylobacter jejuni, which, you know, it's very interesting result for us. And we try, you know, to do more research to find the answer to this, okay? And in addition to those black bone chickens, we also work on Campylobacter in ducks, okay? And what we found here is also quite interesting. Not many information on Campylobacter in ducks. So this one, we follow from maybe around the first week until you know the ducks um, rest for almost a year. Okay, and what we found here is this one for fecal samples. You can detect Campylobacter as early as four days. You know, the first week you can also detect Campylobacter from duck. But please, please keep in mind that this one also open farms. Okay, it's not closed farm. It's open farm. One week. Only the first week we can detect Campylobacter. But the prevalence in general is not that high when compared to chickens. Chickens, you know, have seem to have much more higher prevalence of Campylobacter than ducks based on our studies here. Okay. And if you look at the proportion between Campylobacter jejuni and Campylobacter coli in ducks, what we found is during the first week, you know. The majority of um, Campylobacter that clonize those duck samples in the duck feces, it's Campylobacter coli. And then, you know, you see higher number of Campylobacter jejuni. And at the end, after, I probably say after, let's say six months, right? Um, six, six, seven months, yeah, around six months, five, six months, at a time, 100% are Campylobacter jejuni, okay? So it's quite similar pattern to what we found in those um, black bone chickens. It changed at the beginning, at the earlier day, you know, <clears throat> you can detect those Campylobacter jejuni more. But then when you grow the chicken longer, it changed from Campylobacter coli to Campylobacter jejuni. So now let's talk about the potential source of Campylobacter infection. Because as I just mentioned that uh, based on our studies, you know, we cannot find what is the actual source of contamination in the farms, you know. But in theory, or I mean in the literature, I can show you here for in the information, okay. So based on in the literature and also based on our studies, I think it's pretty clear that vertical transmission is not the big deal. Mainly Campylobacter can go into the farms usually due to horizontal transmission, maybe from the outside environment, but we don't know exactly what are the actual source. And based on the literature reviews, you know, normally each farm, they don't have just only single factor. It's more likely to, you know, came from the multiple source of Campylobacter go to the farms. The first thought, if you're looking at the feed, the clean feed shouldn't be the source of Campylobacter infection because you know it's quite low moisture content and Campylobacter cannot grow very well in those, which is different from Salmonella. Okay. In Salmonella in the chicken farms, they found that your feed can be the source of Salmonella infection in the flock in the farms. But for Campylobacter, it shouldn't be because Campylobacter they don't grow well, you know, in the low moisture content for feed. But if feed contaminate with chicken feces, that's another story, okay? But this one, we're talking about a clean feed that you just get from those um, bags. And then litter, if you use, I'm not sure that in Indonesia how you do it, but in Thailand, normally we don't really use those reused because, you know, if you use those um, old litter, you have more chance to get Campylobacter. Because, you know, especially the wetness here is the critical factor for Campylobacter to survive. So as you see in the picture, you know, if it's wet due to those um, water in the farms or due to those um, feces of the chicken itself, and if you reuse it, it has 
as high chance that you know your flock will be colonized with Campylobacter. Okay, and also untreated water. Normally, if you use those ground water, you know, or water from the natural source. In that case, you may be able to get Campylobacter, okay? But if you use Campylobacter from tap water, it's uncommon to detect Campylobacter. Like when we do our study, epidemiological studies in um, Thai broiler flocks here, when they use tap water, we cannot isolate any Campylobacter on those original source, okay? But if we, but if you use those ground water, sometimes you can get Campylobacter, even if it's not high prevalence but you can get, you can detect some, okay? And normally for the natural water, like in the river or something like that, usually water like that, it's maybe contaminated with um, feces of livestock or wild birds. And as I just mentioned earlier that, you know, those livestock or wild birds can also be the source, can also serve as the source of Campylobacter colonization on the farms, okay? Another thing is insects. Insects like a um, housefly here, like a duckling beetle or cockroach or mealworm here. These are the important source, I believe, you know, personally, I believe these are the important source of um, poultry fox colonization. And it can serve as mechanical vectors. And it can also carry Campylobacter from one location to another location, especially in the case of fly. They can fly, you know, I'm not sure how long or how far they can fly, but there are some studies in European countries, they found that fly can, you know, be the source of Campylobacter, okay? And I personally believe that these things, you know, may be the source of Campylobacter infection in Thai broiler flocks, between flocks. The reason that I'm saying is because, as I just mentioned that in Thailand, you know, we have um, a very good... I probably say we have very good, you know, cleaning system to clean those uh, house after you grow chickens, right? After you catch sick chickens and then send it to slaughterhouse, house, we will have downtime period for about two or three weeks, you know, that we clean the house very well and disinfect that. And then we put the new birds in. During the first two weeks, this also be an, another study that we did, but I haven't shown you here, okay? So after, you know, the first flock, they send to slaughterhouse. I mean, the company clean all those house, okay, disinfect that. And then they put the new batch, the new flock in. And somehow we can detect Campylobacter. Even the first two weeks, we cannot detect Campylobacter in those conventional broiler farms, okay? But let's say the third week is become positive. And somehow it shows those molecular typing similar to the previous flock, okay? So that's why I think that this insects may be the source of contamination of those Campylobacter in the successive flocks or consecutive flocks, okay? The same thing with rodents. Rodents, you know, can also, because I mean like um, insects or rodents here, they can just leave when you clean the house, you know? They can just go somewhere else. And then once you, you know, reopen or you, Rest your chicken again after two or three down time, you know. I mean, those animals like rodents or insects, they can come back, you know, and then they can carry those Campylobacter strains to the flock. That is, I think this may be the reason that's why we found Campylobacter, the same um, genotypes, you know, in very, several successive flocks, okay. And in addition to those rodents, why birds can also be the source, especially, you know, they can do like a fecal, the source of fecal contamination in the environment. Uh, they can do the fecal contamination in the feed or surface water, okay? So it's these things, you know, this animal can be the source of a Campylobacter infection in those broiler farms. The next one is domestic pets, you know, like a dog, cats, or uh, farm animals, you know, like a duck, pig, uh, cows, or wildlife species, like a deer. As I just mentioned earlier, these animals, you know, can be the reservoir of Campylobacter. They can infect by Campylobacter and they can serve, you know, as the source of infection. But this one may be more common in the EU. In 
but I believe in in Thailand, it, this one is not the big problem because, as I just mentioned, that in Thailand here, we raise chicken as the big belong to big company, so we we raise chicken in the closed system, so chickens doesn't have a chance to expose, you know, to other animals or other wild birds or anything wildlife, anything like that. Okay, but in the European studies, in the EU, they found that. When they do some study, they found similar or identical genotypes between Campylobacter isolate from chickens and the one isolate from uh, wildlife or other livestock animals. Okay. Another important factors for Campylobacter colonization in the farm is farm worker here and equipment and also transport vehicle. You know, because if the farmers or farm worker they don't have a good personal hygiene. They can also be the source to bring Campylobacter to the flocks. And especially if your farm, you know, if one farmer, they work on different house or different flocks, you know, I'm not sure that um, how about poultry systems or production system in Indonesia, but in Thailand, as I just mentioned that it belongs to big company. So in one farm, they have maybe let's say five house, 10 house, or 100 house in the same farms, okay? So if one farmer take care of, let's say, five house, or six house, or 10 house, and if this farmer, you know, he doesn't have those um, good um, personal hygiene, he can bring, he can carry Campylobacter from one farm or one house to another house, okay? And also the same thing, not just only farmer himself, but the equipment that you use, you know, between farms or between flocks or between a house, especially this one, transport kits, like when you're going to catch the birds and send it to the slaughterhouse. This, several studies, they found that this transport kits, transport crates here is the important risk factor that bring Campylobacter to the farms. And especially if your farms do departure population in Thailand, Normally we use all in all system. So this is not a big problem. But in um, other countries, like in the UK, our collaborator in the UK, you know, our collaborator, they said that partial depopulation is quite common in the UK, which means that if you have, let's say in one house, in one royal house here, you may have 20,000 birds. But this week you catch maybe 10,000 birds and send to the soil house first. And then a few days later, or a week later, you catch the rest of the birds to the slaughterhouse. In that case, you know, the remaining birds in the house have a high chance to get Campylobacter positive if you do partial depopulation. And it's far very common in most studies, you know, they report this, okay? So you can see that Campylobacter, you know, since chicken is the important vehicle, for Campylobacter transmission to human. So that's why you know, it's necessary to reduce or prevent colonization of Campylobacter in the chicken gut. Because in the gut of the chicken or in the intestinal tract is the only source that Campylobacter can multiply in the food chain. Along the food chain from the production until go to the consumer. Other steps, you know, Campylobacter cannot multiply. As I just mentioned in my earlier slide, that even this chicken meat contaminated with Campylobacter, Campylobacter cannot multiply in this chicken. But the only step that they can multiply is in the intestinal tract of the chickens. Okay, so that's why it's important to control Campylobacter in the gut. Okay, and there are some um, risk assessment studies that they found. You know, if you can reduce Campylobacter colonization or contamination on chicken carcass, this one on chicken carcass by two lock, okay, two lock reduction. You will reduce the incidence of a foodborne campylobacterosis for 30 times. But if you know you reduce, I mean campylobacter colonization in the intestinal tract during the market age, you know, broiler chickens, they found that if you reduce based on that risk assessment studies. They found that if you reduce Campylobacter, you know, in the intestinal tract from three lock reduction, you will reduce 
the public health risk due to this Campylobacter more than 90%, okay? So that's why I say that um, it's also important to control Campylobacter at the farm level, not just only at the uh, post-harvest level, but at the farm level, it's also important, okay? So for the strategies to control Campylobacter at the farms, normally it can separate it into three major strategies. The first one is biosecurity measures here, okay? So if you use those biosecurity to prevent the introduction of Campylobacter to the broiler flocks, and also to prevent the transmission of Campylobacter between flocks, okay? And then you can do, the second strategy is nutritional measures, or you can do like a nutritional manipulation. I mean that you may put some um, compounds, you know, in the feed or in the water to reduce or eliminate Campylobacter carriage in the gut. And then the last one is for the immunization measure or vaccination. This one, you increase host immunity against Campylobacter, okay? So for the first one, for the biosecurity measures here, um, it's, I mean, come on. For these biosecurity measures, it's not just only help to prevent those um, Campylobacter colonization, but it can also prevent um, colonization from um, other foodborne diseases like a salmonella or other diseases like an avian influenza as well. So that's why, you know, biosecurity measure is very important. I mean, so this one is kind of a common thing. I, I think everyone already know about it. Like a visitor, normally you don't allow visitor to visit your farm. And especially in Thailand here, after avian influenza outbreak in 2005, the poultry farm is very strict. So right now when we do our studies, you know, we cannot go inside the farm. We need to tell the company and then the company um, the veterinarian or farm personnel will collect sample for us. They don't allow us to go inside the farm to collect sample by ourselves because, you know, they're really concerned about the biosecurity, okay? So normally they don't allow people to go inside the farm. However, if somehow you allow people to go inside, you have to make sure that those visitors change their clothes or they wear those clean coveralls or disposal suits, you know, and then they have to wear boots, you know, infected boots, our shoe covers, and also hand net, like you see in the picture here, to make sure that, you know, those visitors are not going to bring any disease to the farms, okay? Also, the vehicle that when they, you're going to go outside, outside vehicle, when they're going to go inside the farm, they must be clean and disinfected. The same thing as the equipment that you use in the farm as well. And normally, you know, the equipment shouldn't be used among poultry house uh, between farms. It should be fixed to the certain farms or certain house, okay? Another thing, feed. Feed, yeah, normally feed should be kept um, in the bin, okay? Close in the bin because otherwise, if you leave feed open or you have spill out, in that case, um, why birds, you know, or other insects or rodents, they may come and then eat those feeds, you know, and they may call maybe the source of um, colonization as well, okay? So you need to prevent, keep feed in the bin to prevent um, those contamination. And the next one is for water. For water here, you know, also should be treated, you know, by calling or use um, other sanitizer before use. Because if you use ground water or natural water, as I just mentioned, you may have a chance to get those Campylobacter, you know, and bring Campylobacter to the farms. And litter as well, as I just mentioned again, you know, for litter, you should use only the new litter and clean litter to avoid that um, wet litter. Otherwise, you know, you have more chance to get Campylobacter infection in the farms. And for wild birds here, the same thing, wild birds, animals, like a pets, you know, and also rodents and flies. It should be kept out of poultry house, you know. There are some studies in Denmark. They found that um, during the summer month that I just mentioned that in summer, in European country, they found high prevalence of Campylobacter. So in Denmark, they use those mosquito nets. They wrap around those um, poultry house and they found that once they use those mos mosquito nets, 
the prevalence of Campylobacter in the farm reduced significantly, you know, but I'm not sure whether it's going to be work um, in tropical countries like um, in Thailand or in Indonesia or not, you know, we may have to try it, okay? Another thing is for the all-in-all -all system, this is very important. As I just mentioned earlier, if you do partial depopulation, in that case, you have more chance to get Campylobacter in your flocks. So that's why we recommend you to do all in all system, which means that all birds, you know, enter the house on the same day and leave the house on the same day. You know, all birds don't just do partial, don't just take part of the birds or part of, you know, maybe half, half um, numbers of the bird in the house. Don't do like that. Okay. Another important thing is to clean and disinfect the house between successive flocks, you know. This one can also break the cycle of Campylobacter infection. But as I just mentioned earlier, even the company in Thailand that we have does clean and disinfect poultry house very well, you know, and we have downtime for two to three weeks, we still can detect Campylobacter in the, you know, successive flocks or in the, you know, consecutive flocks. So, and that's one I mentioned that, you know, like uh, insects like this or rodents may be the reason why they bring those uh, Campylobacter back, back to the flocks or back to the farms, even we have downtime periods, okay? So if you use those biosecurity measures, you know, there are some studies and they found that if you have a very good uh, biosecurity measures, it can reduce um, flock colonization about 53 to 86%, okay? But it's still not 100%, okay? And in addition to those biosecurity measures, if you have a very good um, welfare, you know, they also found that if the welfare is very good, you have less, you know, number of Campylobacter or less, you have reduced list of Campylobacter colonization because Campylobacter, Campylobacter may be less stressed. Um, I'm sorry, chicken may be less stressed. Okay. And then they will have um, less colonization as well. So, as you see here, even biosecurity measures alone, even you have good biosecurity, it's still not 100% to prevent Campylobacter infection in a flock. So, that's why you need other measures as well. Like this one, you know, for the nutritional measure. Um, nutritional manipulation. Based on the study or the pleasure review, they report that four major things that can help reduce Campylobacter colonization in the farm, which are probiotics, okay, bacterial sins, bacterial fats, and nutritional natural uh, synthetic chemical addit additives, okay. For probiotics here, as you know, probiotics is the good microorganisms, right? Sometimes you may use it with prebiotics. Prebiotics is the undigestive substance such as phosphooligosaccharide. Even they undigest by the poultry gut, but once they go to the large intestinal tract and then good bacteria, you know, like a beneficial bacteria, like a lactobacillus, they can use this prebiotics and then they can grow very well. So that's why they help control. So if you use those prebiotic in combination with probiotic, in that case, we call symbiotic, okay? And also another thing is, based on the studies, they found that bacterial sins can also, or antimicrobial peptides here, they can reduce Campylobacter colonization very well. And the third one, bacteriophage. As you know, bacteriophage is virus that infected bacteria, you know? So they can also use to control Campylobacter and finally, you know, the natural and synthetic chemical additives such as um, short-chain fatty acid or medium-chain fatty acids, you know, or lack organic acid, things like that, okay? So now let's go to the first one. The first one is the probiotics here. For the probiotics, I think probiotic can do different mechanisms to help control those Campylobacter. Actually, it's not just only Campylobacter, but it also helps control um, other bacteria, other foodborne pathogens like um, salmonella as well, by reduce those pH in the gut, you know, because those foodborne pathogens, they cannot grow well at the pH, at the 
acidic, you know, at the pH about two or three, you know, Campylobacter or some lot cannot go very well. Or uh, these lactic acid bacteria that use in probiotic, they can produce bacteriocin or they can adhere and occupy those adhesion sites, you know, so that when they occupy those adhesion sites, other pathogens cannot be by, you know, to the epithelial cells or they can stimulate immune system. And these are the list of um, bacteria that has um, effects on control campylobacter. Please keep in mind that when, you, when you're talking about probiotics, you know, probiotics can use uh, with different purpose. They may use for growth promotion instead of antibiotics. They can use like an um, alternative to antibiotic for growth promotion. In that case, you may use different, I mean, strains of lactobacillus or other bacteria here, okay? But these are the bacteria, the strain, the species of bacteria that report they can reduce the colonization of Campylobacter that has some effects, okay? And also, um, but the problem with the probiotics is they show con inconsistent results. When I say inconsistent, inconsistent results, it means that some studies, they show very good, they can reduce Campylobacter about four log, but the other studies, they may not see any effects or they just have only one log reduction, something like that, okay? And to improve those probiotics things, they recommend that you need probably need to give it to the chickens after hatchery, you know, before the bird's going to expose to Campylobacter. So that's mean you should give it directly after chick is hatching, okay? In that case, it will improve, I mean, the effectiveness of probiotics. The next one is the bacteriocin. For the bacteriocin here, normally the definition of the bacteriocin is the low molecular weight, you know, peptides. So this one, bacteriocin, is the peptide that's synthesized by a certain strain of the bacteria, okay? And this chemical, I mean, this peptide has effects against other bacteria. Normally, it would be low molecular weight, about five to six kilodalton, okay? And the mechanism how bacteriocin kill those um, bacteria or campylobacter is they're going to disrupt membrane integrity and they're going to form those uh, membrane, transmembrane pore and leading to cell death, okay? So normally, bacteriocin is very interesting because several studies, they report that it's very effective, you know, in reduced campylobacter colonization in poultry. Normally, the one that the bacteriocin does have effect to reduce Campylobacter is the purified bacteriocin from Lactobacillus salivarius, Lact uh, Enterococcus physium, and uh, bacteriocin from Penibacillus polymixa. And the size of purified bacteriocin that has effect to control Campylobacter is about 3.3 .3 to 5.4 kilodaltons, okay? And for the admi administration of the bacteriocin, you just do microencapsulation and then you mix those uh, microencapsulated purified bacteriocin, you know, with the feed or water at the this this is the concentration. It's it's not fixed concentration. It depends on the type of the bacteriocin that you get. Okay. So some studies or some bacteriocin may just use around 30, 31.2 milligram per kilogram feed. Some may require 125 or 250, things like that. It depends on bacteriocin, okay? And also for the water, there are some studies that report that if you use about 12.5 milligram per liter water, in that case, it can also help prevent um, or reduce colonization. Another good thing about bacteriocin is that for the bacteriocin, you just give it short treatment period, means that you don't have to give it for a long time. For the probiotics, sometimes some studies recommend you give for 42 days throughout the life from the first day until the birds are sent to the slaughterhouse. But for the bacteriocin, the good thing is you just use only two or three day treatment, okay? That's it. And then it can help reduce um, Campylobacter sickness significantly, okay? And also, so that's why since you just need only two or three days for the treatment, this bacteriocin is very useful when you do it, you know, prior to send the chicken to the slaughterhouse. That's mean 
if you grow chicken for 42 days, you may do it, let's say at the day 38, 37, 38, something like that, you know, before you send the birds to the slaughterhouse and it will reduce Campylobacter in the intestinal tract significantly. More study, they found that the bacteriocin can reduce Campylobacter at least four log CFD per gram, which show very promising results. But until now, you know, there are not commercially available bacteriocin to control Campylobacter in the market. The reason, one reason, one main reason is because the production cost, because to produce the purified, purified those bacteriocin, you need, you know, a lot of money. You need to grow those bacteria strains in the fermenter. And then one lid of those um, liquid things, you may, gas, you may just get maybe about around 10 to 100 milligram of bacteriocin. So that's why the production cost is very high. This is one thing that you need to be concerned, okay? Another thing is bacteriophage. Bacteriophage here is, as you know, is virus that infected bacteria. The good thing about bacteriophage is that they have highly specific for bacterial species. So that means if those bacteriophage specific for Campylobacter, they're going to have very minimal effects on other microbiota. This is a good thing when you want to use bacteriophage because they, they will not have any effects on those um, uh, normal flora in the intestinal tract, okay? And the mechanism for bacteriophage is that they buy and then they penetrate into the bacterial cells because they need to buy to those specific receptors on the cells, right? And after that, this bacteriophage multiply inside in the cytoplasm of the bacterial cells and then make the cell birds, you know, or cell lysis, and then the bacteria become dead by the time, you know? So normally bacteriophage that have effect on Campylobacter, they can be isolated from different sources like in the manure, in the sewage, or in the abattoir effluents. Okay, and this um, bacteriophage, okay, also more suitable to use as a short-term treatment, similar to those bacteriocin. You just use only a few days for the treatment. But the problem with bacteriophage is that if there are some studies and they, they found that during the first, you know, one day or two days after treatment, you can reduce maybe three locks, you know, two, three locks of um, Campylobacter in the gut, in the feces. But after that, the effectiveness reduced over five days, you know, after initial administration. So that's why they recommend to use bacteriophage just only a few days, you know, and also you can use as a decontamination techniques to reduce Campylobacter that contaminate that on poultry meat, not just only in the intestinal tract of the chickens, but you can use, there are some studies that they do um, to reduce Campylobacter that contaminate on chicken meat by using those bacteriophage as well, okay? And to give it in chicken, you can just, do encapsulation and give it, you know, into the feed or water. And normally the results that you found is not that good when compared to bacteriocin. Bacteriophage can reduce about one to three log CFU per gram compared to bacteriocins that have higher, you know, maybe more than four logs that I just mentioned. Another thing that you need to be concerned is the phage resistance because bacteria can become resistant to the phage very quickly. So that's why you can see here, that's why they said after five days after initial treatment, you can see some number of Campylobacter back to the normal level, okay? So because bacteria can become resistant very quickly, so that's why if you're gonna use a bacteriophage, they recommend you to use a, like a cocktail, which means that you use different phage strains, okay? Not just only single strains, okay? And also, at this moment, there is no commercially available bacteriophage against Campylobacter. And another one is natural and synthetic chemical additive. As I just mentioned earlier, you can, there are different things you know, that you can use to control Campylobacter, such as short chain or medium chain fatty acids, like the carpylic, 
acid here, you know, or lactic acid, organic acid, or glycerol monocarprate, or folic tyrosine. This thing, they have some um, studies and they report that this um, substance or this additive, you know, can help reduce Campylobacter in the intestinal tract. And it's common, you can just juice it by mix it in the drinking water or mix it with the feed, okay? But the problem with this uh, natural and synthetic chemical additive is that it shows consistent results. Sometimes you get good results. Sometimes you don't see any results. But the average, they found that um, it's about to lock reduction of Campylobacter, okay? And also like a probiotics, they recommend that if you want to improve or get better results from this chemical additive, they recommend you to use at the hatching, okay? Maybe right away after hatch from the eggs, that may provide better results the first day of life. And the third um, strategy is immunization measure or vaccination. For vaccine to control Campylobacter, you can do a different way. You can use those um, live attenuated vaccine, or you can do a uh, kill whole cell vaccine, or you can do subunit vaccine. I mean, you can do different ways, okay? Different type of vaccine can be used, can be used you know, to control Campylobacter. And for this one, um, for the subunit protein, protein subunit vaccine, normally the target candidate vaccine, it will be protein that associated with colonization of flagellum or outer membrane, like a FLA gene here, or FLPA, or FLID. These are the proteins that associated, mainly associated with a colonization of flagellum or outer membrane, okay? So this one, so they can be used as a vaccine candidate. The good thing is, one thing that you need to consider is, if you want to develop vaccine, you know, it's better to induce those mucosal immunity because as I just mentioned earlier that, you know, to control Campylobacter, because Campylobacter is located mainly in the mucus layer. So it's better, you know, to produce those vaccine and then it can induce those mucosal immunity. It's made better than induce those systemic immunity, okay? And for the vaccine, um, generally the results of the vaccine, um, like use the vaccine to control Campylobacter the result is varies, you know, but average is about two log CFU per gram. But some studies may file four log or six log, it depends. But mainly most of the study found it can reduce about two logs, okay? And also for, if you're gonna use those vaccine, develop vaccine to against Campylobacter, there are several things that you need to be keep in mind. The first one is the target antigen that you're gonna select, you know, because as the results I just showed you, you know, in our study and in other studies that in one flock, you can have Campylobacter, not just in one strain. As, as I just showed you, you may have Campylobacter coli, Campylobacter jejuni, and even among those Campylobacter jejuni or Campylobacter coli strain, you also have different sequence type, right? That I just, that's I told you that in one flock, maybe you can detect about three to four um, sequence type, but we will find one do predominant sequence in each flock, okay? So that's why when you select candidate, vaccine candidate, you have to make sure that it have a cross-protective immunity against different strains of Campylobacter. Another thing that you need to keep in mind is how you're going to deliver those um, vaccine target. You're going to use um, which adjuvant that you're going to use. Some studies, they use salmonella as a vector vaccine, or some, they use E. coli. And also root of administration, you know, you're gonna do oral vaccine, or you're gonna do um, by injection. There are some studies that they do intramuscular injection, and they found that it gives better results than oral vaccine, things like that, you know, you have to keep in mind. And at the moment, again, it's still no commercially available vaccine against Campylobacter in the market it's still in the developmental stage, okay? So from this one, from the prevention and control strategy of Campylobacter in the farms, okay? The key message is um, to effectively control Campylobacter. I think first you use those biosecurity measure 
in combination with other intervention strategies, you know, such as, like I mentioned, you may use probiotics or you may use bacterial sins or bacterial phage or other chemical substance. In that case, it may help reduce, prevent, or delay Campylobacter colonized in the broiler flocks. And also to effectively reduce Campylobacter in chicken meat, I recommend you to do both level at both um, farms and also slaughterhouse levels. Okay. So this um, is the second part of my presentation. And for the last part, you know, because we have white time limit, so I just touch on this a little bit. Okay. So for the last part, it's going to be about antimicrobial resistance. So for this one, right now, drug resistant Campylobacter, you know, is considered as quite big problems. And the one, you know, by CDC, the CDC consider um, drug resistant Campylobacter as a serious threat levels, you know, especially for the pulopinolone resistant. If you remember, I just mentioned to you that from my earlier slides that I would like you to focus on two antibiotics. The first one is fulloquinolone, like a ciprofloxacin, and the other one is macrolide, like erythromycin, okay? Because these are the drugs of choice for the treatment of woodborne campylobacterosis. Generally, it's not just only in our studies or in other, stu uh, in other countries. We found similar results in campylobacter in terms of antimicrobial susceptibility testing which means that most of the studies that work on antibiotic resistance of Campylobacter, they found that Campylobacter has a high resistance to fluoroquinolone and tetracycline, but they have lower resistance rate to macrolides, okay? And also for fluoroquinolone resistance here, you can see high resistance rate in both human and animal isolates. And it's sometimes in some countries like in Thailand, or in Southern Europe, like uh, in um, Spain or in Italy, it can be as high as or 100% for fulloquinolone resistance in Campylobacter. That's why it's a very big problem. I'm not sure about in Indonesia, you have that kind of problem or not, you know, but in Thailand, fulloquinolone resistance is a very big problem. And there is some study and they show that a clear association between fulloquinolone use and increase resistance rates, okay? So that means um, once you use fluoroquinolone, Campylobacter can become resistant very quickly, okay? But for macrolide resistance, it's a little bit different stories, you know? For macrolide here is, you know, the mac rate of resistance, it can be ranging from zero to 80%, okay? And it's more common in animal isolates than um, human isolates. Also, another interesting thing that I would like to point out is in terms of macrolide resistance, it's common in Campylobacter coli than Campylobacter jejuni, okay? So, and as I just mentioned that Campylobacter coli, it's more common in swine and turkey. So that's why if you look at the most report of the erythromycin resistance, it mainly found in isolate, Campylobacter isolate from pigs because you know, pigs has more C, J, C. coli than C. J. J. I, okay? And another different thing between um, Campylobacter, between fluoroquinolone resistance and macrolide resistance is that you need long-term exposure to develop erythromycin resistance. It's not just only a few days, like in the case of fluoroquinolone, but it takes longer time, maybe um, 10 days, I mean, more than two weeks, you know, to develop resistance. And this slide show you um, the resistance rate to ciprofloxacin in the green bar here and tetracycline in the purple bar here. And then for the macrolide or erythromycin is in the yellow or orange bar here. So you can see that in general, Campylobacter in EU countries, you know, is highly resistant in ciprofloxacin and also tetracycline. And in Thailand, we also found the same pattern, you know, resistant that high in ciprofloxacin and tetracycline and lower resistant to erythromycin here, okay? Normally for erythromycin, 
in most country we found lower than 25 percent okay some certain country or some certain animal it can be high but generally in chicken isolates normally it's less than 25 percent and for gentamicin usually it's less than five percent resistant you know and it's common everywhere it's not just only in the eu or in the thailand but in everywhere in most studies okay and this slide shows you the trends of um, resistance in different countries in Europe. As I showed you earlier, you know, that the green line here represents dosiprofloxacin and the blue line here represents tetracycline. And the orange or yellow line here represents those um, erythromycin. So you can see like as countries in Spain, or Italy, Southern Europe here, you found very high fluoroquinolone resistance rates, almost 100% among Campylobacter isolates, okay? And this, uh, this study, this graph show you how Campylobacter develop resistance to fluoroquinolone and macrolide. Basically, you can see here, just only one day after exposure to fluoroquinolone resistant, Campylobacter can become resistant to fluoroquinolone or erythromycin. Uh, ciprofloxacin just only one day after treatment, okay? And then five days after treatment, almost 100% of the isolate show resistance to uh, fluoroquinolone, okay? And for this one, for macrolide, it's different. As I just mentioned earlier, if you treat um, Campylobacter with macrolide at subtherapeutic level, it takes about 31 days to develop mutation or develop resistance, okay? And also another, stud another studies or another uh, part of the studies, what they do is this one, they increase the treatment dose, you know, and even they increase the, to the therapeutic levels, it still take for at least, you know, 17 days to develop resistance, okay? So the key message from this one is that, you know, fluoroquinolone resistance, develop very quickly, you know, after exposure, which is different from um, macrolide resistance in Campylobacter, it takes longer time to develop resistance. So that's why if you treat um, humans or patients or animals with, with a macrolide, normally, you know, you don't see, you can have low risk of resistance development for macrolide, okay? Like a tylosine that commonly used in the farms. But for fluoroquinolone, like enrofloxacin, it's developed resistance very quickly, okay? And I think that's pretty much about what I would like to share with you guys. And I'm so sorry that it's take longer than I expect, okay? So um, for my two, last two slides, I would like to thank those um, uh, financial support, all the research, you know, that you see that I present the result here is from an STD in Thailand and also from our university. And also I would like to thank those uh, poultry producers, veterinarians and farm personnel, you know, who help with um, sample collection and allow us to collect samples, okay? And the last but not least, I mean, all the results that you see that I just showed you, it would be impossible without those graduate students, my former students, you know, and also current students and our staff in our lab, you know, like at this one, it's a former student that already graduated. Um, Miss Chai Lai already retired, and then this uh, current staff, Miss Nerma, is still working with me in the lab, you know. So all the results that you see is from those um, students who help with the project, okay. And I think that pretty much I have, I would like, you know, I have to share with you guys today. And thank you, um, the Alanga University for inviting me to share those um, experience with Campbell back the work that we did. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Masih termute, Dr. Suri. Yeah, so I mean, if you have any questions, you know, I'm more than happy, you know, to answer that. Yes. 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 May I? Yes, I think yep. we are yes, now please. in a question and answer session. So please, audience, if you have any uh, question, would you please to raise your hand or just uh, mention your name first and uh, 
me uh, what is your question directly. Okay. The first one is for Dr. Kukulagawa. Okay. Okay, thank you very much uh, for my for the time. Okay, my name is Jokal Gawa. I'm from Division of Pathology Veterinary. And first of all, I would like to uh, to say thank you for uh, Dr. Taradon for the valuable uh, presentation and very useful uh, information for us here in a Faculty of Veterinary Medicine in Ireland University. It's a I personally very appreciate for that. Okay, first of all, I want to know about the uh, relationship between the ambient temperature, ambient temperature and humidity with the level of uh, Campylobacter infection in the poultry industry. And oh, okay. okay, and the second, <laughs> maybe I will uh, continue it. Uh, and another thing is I want to know uh, whether you are also searching about uh, or have uh, secondary data related to relation relationship between heat stresses and a level of Campylobacter infection in chicken. Thank you for Dr. Narodan. Okay. So for yeah. your first questions about yeah. the ambient temperatures, right? And humidity, yeah. what we found is um, in Thailand, you know, as I just yeah. mentioned that we rest chickens in the inside the closed system. Yeah. So normally the temperature is quite consistent, about 28 degrees. So even outside it's changed, you know, yeah. it's maybe rain or sunny or, but inside the house yeah. is still the same. So in that case, you know, I don't think um, ambient temperature or anything has significant effects. The same thing as the humidity too, because in poultry production in Thailand here, they use yeah. evaporation system. So okay. I think if I remember correctly, humidity may be around 70, 75%, something like that in the house. Yeah. If I, mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure, but if I remember correctly, okay. So in that case, you know, it's, mm -hmm. It's can you know it's common for chickens and we can detect Campylobacter. For your second questions about the heat stress, uh, I'm sorry that I don't have um, any information on that. We didn't do specifically on the you know significant risk how Campylobacter yeah. respond to heat stress. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Can, may I uh, directly continue about my question? Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, because. Uh, as we know that uh, heat stress is, uh, I think, is the major factor that mm -hmm. can decrease uh, the immune system uh, mm -hmm. for uh, uh, every animal, yeah, uh, animal kingdom, I think. And and I have experienced that even that the chicken has been uh, uh, have a special case uh, with what we say a uh, close house system, uh -huh. yeah. But the the fact is the the case of infection is uh, still high in the sums of breeder. As you, as your information from the, your first chart about mm -hmm. the level of infection in the five area, different area. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and as you said then from your presentation, the high level of complementary between infection is in the breeder. Uh, yes, I am very appreciate for your uh, uh, answer, Dr. Taradan, but I know that you know uh, specifically uh, research, uh, research, uh, research about the relation between heat stress and the uh, uh, Campylobacter infection, I think. Yep, and, and thank you for your um, question and your comment. So yeah. I think that maybe, I, I don't know, but I guess this may be yeah. one of the explanation that I show you that, you know, somehow yeah. why the outside, the yeah. birds that have open farms may have yeah. more Campylobacter coli I think yeah. it's may relate to his stress that you mentioned. It, it may be possible, you know. And I think that's maybe a good, another point that we can do some studies, yeah. Yeah, thank you yes. very much. Yeah, so I thank you for, for your, your Yeah, for your future study about that. Thank mm -hmm. you, Dr. Taradan. Yep. Thank you. Dr. Taradan and Dr. Kekolepova, maybe uh, for the other, other audience, is there any question? No. Um, maybe I want to ask you also some questions. <clears throat> okay. 
Yeah. What do you think? Why the uh, uh, antibiotic resistance against uh, chloroquinolone mm -hmm. occurs spontan spontaneously at a relatively high frequency, mm -hmm. high frequency after exposure? Mm -hmm. Okay. Explain yeah, I think that one is because of the fitness cost, okay? Because um, we do some studies and we found that, I mean, um, they are, they call, they have, um, because first I have to tell you the mechanism of resistance first, okay? Mm -hmm. So the mechanism for fulloquinolone resistance is point mutation in gyrus A. But the mechanism for macrolide erythromycin resistance is point mutation in 23S RNA, okay? And when we do the study in the fitness, we found that those um, Campylobacter that has um, gyrus A mutation, they have some kind, like a related to, if they call like MFD gene, if I remember correctly, which um, responds to those um, fitness of Campylobacter, okay? So that's why once uh, Campylobacter exposed to those um, drugs, they can change um, very rapidly, we call, and also the frequency of mutation. Because we know that frequency of mutation between different genes has um, different frequency rate, okay? For example, like um, Gyrus here, Gyrus A here in Campylobacter, it has mutation very quickly, just only um, 10 to the minus six, which means that in, in thousand bacteria, you have one bacteria to develop resistance. Okay, point mutation. But for uh, mechanism of resistance to macrolides or erythromycin, the frequency of mutation in 23S RNA is 10 to the minus 10. Which, which means that you need more than billion cells to get one mutation. So that's why I think that's maybe one of the explanation why a full open resistance develop very quickly when compared to those um, erythromycin resistance. Yep. So it's depend also the concentration of the uh, Campylobacter. Yep, yeah, this one in Campylobacter. In other bacteria, it may be different, yeah. And what we found is once Campylobacter become resistant to those full open alone, it can stay forever. Like in Thailand, in the past, we used in Thailand in poultry production, they use a lot of enrofloxacin, okay? And then once Campylobacter, you know, exposed to those enrofloxacin and they become resistant, even right now, we stopped using fluoroquinolones like enrofloxacin for a while. Mm -hmm. It's also detect, I mean, we can still detect high prevalence of fluoroquinolone resistance among Campylobacter isolates in Thailand, 80-90%. And it's also common, and this one is not just in Thailand, but in the US as well. In the US, they banned um, enrofloxacin in, in 2005, but I'm not sure that you're familiar with NARMS, NAM is National Antimicrobial Resistance Monitoring System. They monitor those um, resistance rate of the foodborne pathogen in the US. And they found that even they banned uh, enrofloxacin juice in chicken in 2005, okay? Even right now until close to 2020, they can still detect similar rates of resistance. It's not dropped, it's not gone, you know? Even you don't use for 10 years, so it is common for, I think it's quite special for Campylobacter and fluoroquinone resistance, yeah. So, Dr. Badi? Yeah, yeah. Any uh, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Luang Tong Kum. If I not mistake, you have informed that the Campylobacter have little effect on economical poultry industry. I mean, yep, not, yep. So, not so impact about the economic, right? Mm -hmm. It it's don't cause any disease in chicken, okay? But if you talk about economics, it depends on your country, mm. okay? 
for example, like in Thailand, in Thailand we export a lot of chickens. So if Campylobacter, so because I mean we export chicken mainly to EU country, uh. and right now EU country they're gonna use Campylobacter as a trade barrier. That means if we're gonna export chicken to EU, it needs to be Campylobacter free. That's what the concept. Okay? okay. So that's why if we have chicken, our chicken contaminated with Campylobacter, we cannot export. In that case, it may have effect. Okay. But if your country don't base on the export of chickens, if just mainly consumption in the countries, yeah. in that case, it may have effects on those um, consumer, you know, but not economics or animal itself. Yeah. Okay. Because the reason like that, mm -hmm. the now my fear is the most have attention is economic in the poultry first. Mm -hmm. Because head about the head and the people that's at the site yeah. <laughs> and in Indonesia we just ban of the antibiotic growth promoter mm -hmm. yeah. in the 2018 or something mm -hmm. the problem I don't know how to that change for on this growth promoter so your information is very important for us might be like probiotic or maybe other substance like uh, like the exit or maybe is the simple vaccine like whole whole uh, vaccine whole protein mm -hmm. that is not high the technology yeah yeah because uh, so maybe thank you for your for your uh, lecture. So we can think maybe we can we can some of the of the what the some the simple things to because as you know now in Indonesia we have also like and you and then we have conventional and then big poultry and the free ring and something and then. Uh, that's now I think this we, we need to how to improve that because we worried about if the government have been banned but mm -hmm. we don't give some of the how to solve this problem uh, that's uh, very very terrible I think. Yeah, exactly yeah like um in Thailand too you know in Thailand we banned those um antibiotic as a growth promoter in 2006 ah. Because we export chicken to EU and EU, you know, ban. That's why it forced us that we cannot use antibiotic as a growth promoter, okay? okay? And once, I mean, after we stop using those antibiotic as a growth promoter in chicken production, we found that um, necrotic enteritis due to this costidium, you know, <clears throat> has high, I mean, increased the prevalence of necrotic enteritis <laughs> for the last few days after the bans, okay? Yeah, so I think it needs something to control those diseases as well. Yeah. Yeah. And, and yeah. As, um, as, as you mentioned, you know, that's probiotic things. Actually, it came back because like when I was in um, vet school, you know, about 20 years ago, okay? In that time, we also worked on the probiotics as uh, yeah. one of my senior projects, the project I did before I graduated, you know, in, in July, we have to do senior projects. Uh -huh. And at that time, we do, I do, I and my friends do the effect of um, probiotics to control salmonella. And right now, you know, after the ban of probiot uh, antibiotics, 20 years, it's come back right now. All technology like a probiotics, you know, or prebiotics things come back, you know, use it again because right now you cannot use any antibiotics as a growth promoter anymore. Yeah. Because uh, previously, people want to can kill all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what it you say is you we reduce a uh, two three log cycle. That's mm -hmm. a big meaning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's uh, because very good to opportunity. Because mm -hmm. if yes. we can to develop the very high. 
uh, level, the mean like hundred uh, percent to kill. Maybe if we just reduce, if have big impact. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think, I think we we can start to think about that to to how to support our farmer because that yeah. I think I think now in Indonesia and we. We just have because uh, poultry that's the the mis industry. They say <laughs> all yeah. the resistance problem is came from poultry. Even mm-hmm. might be we have missed about the and the medicine or something. Mm-hmm. But now is I heard from from some of the medical doctor is. Animal is the most miss in the mm-hmm. middle of the antibiotic. That's I think now, and I think in Indonesia, like fluoroquinolone is not used in in poultry or something because they are expensive, mm-hmm. right? Even we have we have also and the sample from human. Okay, we have some of the fluoroquinolone yeah. resistant. Might be some of the Uh, apa third generation of cephalosporin carbapen mm-hmm. yeah but i think that is not came from poultry because mm-hmm. that's expensive thing i okay. see yeah okay yep that that's good point yeah and i think it'd be interesting if i mean if the poultry production in indonesia do you, you don't use those you know fluoroquinolones i think it might be interesting to see whether you have any Fluoroquinolone resistant in Campylobacter or not? You know, I don't know exactly, but mm-hmm. uh, in my mind, that's because in in Indonesia is the poultry price is not so high. Mm-hmm. That is too expensive to I see, yeah. to use the that sucks the anti antibiotic because okay. it is not. Uh, I think. One kilo is one dollar. Around is one dollar. Mm-hmm. So not so. So can imagine is the antibiotic is half dollar. That is impossible, mm-hmm. right? So yeah. in poultry, yeah. And 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 I'm just I'm just curious in terms of poultry production in the Indonesia here. Normally, it's belong to big companies or belong to like um. Farmers like a small size backyard things or how? So um, mix, mix big okay. company, small company, backyard chicken that <laughs> we mix together. We have to all together. I see. Okay, because yeah. when I do did the project with the Philippines, the Philippines said that you know most of the chicken it's like a backyard flock, the smaller size, which totally opposite from the one that we have in Thailand. In Thailand. Protein production is belong to big company, you know, and they have everything like equipment, you know, close systems. Yeah. No, oh, it's big company. They have all of the slaughtering house, mm-hmm. and then mostly go to the retail is mm-hmm. project. Yeah. So small farm, they go to traditional market. Mm-hmm. So if you take the sample from traditional market. Maybe this is belong to small farm. I see, yeah. But another is the coffee farm. Mm-hmm. But we also have the free ring chicken or yeah. something. Just yeah. mix. Everything mix. is mixed. And then some of people, the poultry and very close or something. <laughs> we, we just, okay. So I this just uh, how to support this farmer. That's on the, I think. Okay, thank you very much for your time. Yep, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Is there any question more? More question? Okay. I think there is no question anymore. So um <clears throat> yes, please. Is there any question? No. Okay. So, dear audience, we finally come to the end part of this lecture. So, before I close, I would like to thank so much 
to Dr. Charanon Luang Fangkam for this informative and interesting lecture. And also to uh, all of the audience that uh, uh, for very uh, silent participation and also um, for, for the active participation from uh, Dr. Uh, Dadi and Dr. Joko Lekowo. Hopefully this lecture will be beneficial for everybody. So uh, please give applause for uh, our... Thank you, Dr. 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 Randon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Thank you for Thank inviting you, me. Dr. Luang Tangkon and yeah. we hope see you yep. next time. Yep. Thank Oops. you. <laughs> So last but not least, uh, we would like to give you the certificate uh, for the awarded to you, Dr. Charandan Luang Tang Okay, thank, thank thank you very much. Yeah. Hopefully next time we will meet again. Okay. Yeah. For the uh, other uh, topics. Yeah. So so I, I hope to you know after the maybe after COVID. <laughs> like, you know, we can actually visit each other, you know, instead oh, yeah. of virtual Thank you. like this. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. So, uh, okay. I will give uh, the time to Dr. Prima. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Sole, for guiding the session. And thank you very much for Dr. Saradon. Finally, we get the last session that is closing on behalf of the committee. I would like to thanks to the speaker, Dr. Taradon, and all the participants for the participation today. If there are any imperfection during the implementation of this event, we would like to apologize to everyone. Let's close this event by saying, Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam Thank you very much Dr. Thank you Thank you Thank you Dr. Thank you Thank you Thank you Thank you Thank you